was an extraordinary figure in London, some, a young person who really made echoes wherever he went, who was a critic, and that was Kenneth Tynan, a legendary figure at that time, and a good friend. And one day he said to me, I've just read a remarkable book, you must read it, it's called Lord of the Flies, and it's been bought by Ealing Studios who want to make a film of it. So I read the book immediately and thought it was absolutely remarkable. And I suppose at the time, what touched me intuitively, looking back, I realized there's something that has always, always interested me, which is when a subject is at one and the same moment a myth, so it goes beyond all the heaviness and r reduction of naturalism, and yet is so close to everyday life that one can at once recognize it as not a myth in the abstract sense of the word, but something about us. And reading this and seeing that Golding had chosen to talk about humanity, not as an abstraction, but through specific, recognizable, everyday children, in a very unusual but possible circumstance, being shipwrecked on a desert island, I saw that he had done this remarkable thing. He had brought together a myth of creation, a myth of mankind, a myth of how man at once has to be divided and how division becomes the social division, division into opposing points of view which become fights and how at the same time he could combine this with the other great English myth of Robinson Crusoe, I thought it was extraordinary. I thought I must make a film of this. Halt! It seemed to me that there was a marvelous film to be made which could bring something beyond what the beautiful writing of Golding did. With a film, there was the possibility of a further link with the viewer, and that was the fact that real children with real faces, living real experiences, brings what only photography can give. And here it was something that has always, again, fascinated me in cinema. How can one introduce into this very, very precise, naturalistic, medium, which today produces, of course, through television, so constantly the soap opera, which is entirely plunged into the detail of everyday life. How can one combine that recognizable reality of the photograph with something hidden? Some great photographers like Cartier-Bresson have succeeded, and as I read the book, I thought, ah, this is possible. Here, there is a myth, but it's not like something that for me would have been very boring, which is to make a film about a Greek myth with some actor, where, like there are so many f films that come out again and again, where an actor in a toga pretending to be some Greek hero and eventually somebody else dressed in some other designer's imaginary costume being a Greek god. I thought, no, here, the myth is there in the unshakable reality of the child's face, and at the same time, there is something of the magic of Golding's writings that could be preserved by filming it truly on a desert island. Morris. Robert. From the moment I found this subject and felt there's no question, now, this takes priority over everything, I must make this film, then the material question arose, how and with whom? Now, Ealing Studios had made a script, they tried to get it, they lost faith in it, and it was just standing around there, and they were doing nothing with it. I approached a top Hollywood producer who happened to be a good family friend, Sam Spiegel, and I said, here, I want to make this film, and I knew that the terrible thing of working with a Hollywood 
producer is that they would dominate everything. I thought, here is a marvelous possibility because I can make this very cheaply. I said, look, Sam, all I need is for you to finance me to go on a beach in a little island with a group of kids, and you can make a film there. We can make a film together next to nothing from your point of view, your budgets, but I will have complete freedom. Oh, he said, marvelous idea. He bought the work. We started work together, and then soon I saw all my freedom disappearing as his ambition as a producer made it impossible for him, having made The Bridge on the River, Kwai, Lawrence of Arabia, such big films, to make a cheap film. So he began, almost unconsciously, boosting the budget. He, he got a new team, he sent art directors around the world looking at different islands, he made budgets for the air conditioning that the big team would need to work on this island, and gradually it came up to what in those days was an enormous budget of a million dollars. And Columbia, who were behind him, said, but this is too much for a film about kids. So he said, well, Golding has reduced the audience interest because he only made it about boys. And Golding had said, boys to me represents the whole of mankind. If I introduce girls, then puberty and little girls' sexual problems with the boys will cut right through the main theme. So boy is, not, is just in the way that today one uses man to mean men and women. And boy here is humanity. But this Spiegel wouldn't listen to. He said, no, if we can introduce a lot of little girls into the subject, that would make it more exciting. And then he looked at the first script that my great friend Peter Schaffer had written and said, ah, but that's all on one island. He said, we've got to find a way of getting them off their asses. How can we get these kids off their asses? I know. We must make it a trek. So it's an enormous island, and they have to try to get to what they think is salvation on the other side of the mountain, so they're on the way, so it's something is moving all the time. And by the time he'd done this to try to boost the film, which got more and more expensive, and to police Columbia, I realized that the film that I wanted to make couldn't be possible, and there was an angry lunch in a Piccadilly restaurant, where in the middle of lunch, I just got up and said, I give it back to you, and he said, no, you take it. I don't care at all. Take the subject and do with it what you want. He didn't really mean this, but I left and said, I'll do this the way that I've always felt it has to be done, very cheaply. And I found a young American producer who also was just beginning to make films on the lowest possible budget with a few con support backers amongst some real estate people. And he then went formally to Sam Spiegel and I said, I hear you have given the subject over to Peter Brook. Oh yes, he said, but I want to get back all the money that we have invested in it so far. We bought the rights. We bought it back from Ealing Studios who demanded quite a lot of money for it. We've been working on it for a year. We've engaged people. So on our tiny budget, and he put together a budget of about $300,000, which was a lot in those days from his Wall Street real estate connections, over half the budget went to paying off this, the greed of a Hollywood producer who feels, I've got to get back the money that Columbia has spent. So we were left with about $150,000. So then we found the nearest island, and by looking around and doing some traveling, I went with Luella, the producer, we went to Mexico, we went to various places where we had connections, and in the end found Puerto Rico, a tiny island called Vieques, just off Puerto Rico, as close as we could get to New York. We said that we'll do the bulk of the children, English-speaking children, rather English children in American schools in New York, so we could have very little reduced traveling expenses. In the end, we only found one boy, which was the piggy, who we found in England, but that's another story. I'll come back to that later. And the first character we found quite easily was Jack. It was to find a strong, good-looking, energetic, ambitious young 
boy was quite easy. To find the finer qualities, the purer qualities of Ralph was much harder to find and until very, very late we couldn't find it at all. And then in the end, we, I was told that there was a, an army barracks in Jamaica and we went to Jamaica, the producer and myself, and we saw kids in the swimming pool in the army barracks and there was one boy who had once stood out and we watched him and he ran off to play and he climbed on a tree and the other kids were playing a war game and he fell off the tree and he fell off and he s screamed and got up limping and said, I've broken my leg. And everyone crowded around him and we didn't know, was he acting or was it real? And in fact, it was pure acting and we said, ah, this boy is a born actor. And at the same time, very sensitive because his father was an army man and he grew up in this strict discipline and yet he was a very sensitive soul who felt that this isn't right, this isn't life. And so that contradiction between an English discipline and an English secret sensitivity was what we were looking for, which you see in the end when he's really crying for the tragedy as he watches the island, this beautiful island burning and he sees all that has come about, that is real, and he became an actor. And the Simon it was really looking and searching for somebody with that real, simple, pure sense of, an, of another world, which was so important, because there again, that sense of the visible and the invisible, which is so important, is all portrayed just by the face, the quietness. Story. It's about the place where I live, called Camberley. Piggy, from the word go, was going to be the big problem. Where in the world could one find a boy who can play without any artifice, makeup, false stomachs, as you could use with professional actors playing full staff, without any devices, who was really born to play Piggy? So we looked through all the schools we could. We looked here and there, and I, my assistant would call up people, businessmen from England, working in America, and he would use the same word which in those days every man of a certain age remembered from his childhood. He said, we're looking for a Billy Bunter, because Billy Bunter was the fat boy in comics that we all knew 50 or 60 years ago. And he said that whenever he got through to a, a cold businessman who said, I don't know why you're wasting my time. What's it do you want with me? Because I have nothing to do with films or with small boys. He said, we're looking for a Billy Bunter. And then there'd be a chuckle. And he'd say, well, you know, I did the other weekend see somebody who might. And so we followed up all these tracks. No good at all. Luckily, the most unexpected things can help. I happened to mentioned to a journalist friend in New York who was working for the Daily Telegraph that we were having this difficulty, and he put a little piece in the Daily Telegraph in London saying that people making a film of Lord of the Flies are still looking for a Billy Bunter and they're due to start shooting in a few weeks' time. And we'd taken this risk. We had no Ralph, who we found two weeks before the film start. Everything was ready to shoot, but no trace of a piggy. And a few days later, and this is unbelievable, but a letter arrived on a page torn out of an exercise book, a lined paper, saying, Dear Sir, I think I am the piggy you're looking for, signed Hugh Edwards, with some grubby thumbprints and a tiny photograph. And looking at the tiny photograph, I knew that's him. They used to call me Piggy. Piggy! As long as you don't tell the others. But there was still a problem. How are we going to pay for the unit? We saw there's only one way. We must make this with people who have never made films before and can't charge us even minimum rates. 
So we looked around and there was a superb, brilliant still photographer who lived on the island and called Tom Holliman and he did photographs, travel photographs for various American magazines. He'd never touched a film camera. I said, would you like the challenge of making a film? He said, very exciting. I've always wanted to do this. I've never had a camera in my hands, but I'm sure I can manage. So he said, OK. Then on the island, there was another man whose hobby, it was purely his hobby, was doing recordings of folk music. So he had a tape recorder. So I went to him and I said, would you like to be the sound man? He said, oh, thrilling. Then we thought, with the boys who we're bringing together, some of them, the mothers, would not want to let their children be unaccompanied. So we said, all the crew of looking after the kids, and then other things like looking after the clothes, wardrobe, costume mistress, that can be the mothers. And so in this way, we got together the most inexpensive film unit there's ever been. And it brought it back to me to a conviction I had from the day I started very young in movies, and which has remained to this day, which is why I've never made a commercial movie. And that is, if you're a director and you want to be absolutely free, you have to make films as cheaply as possible. This was the secret of the new wave in France. A new generation emerged because they could go against the big machinery of feature film production and start making films very cheaply. And today, with little digital cameras, that freedom is coming back to making films completely the way that one wishes to, because films eventually are a work of an author who is the director. That is, essentially, it's the opposite of theatre, which is collective. Theatre is one person behind the camera in the end. I've tried to break this by having several cameras and several people to a degree, but still, a film remains one person. And for that reason, the freer you are, the cheaper the budget must be. But this entailed enormous difficulties. The first difficulty was that the cameraman thought, well, photography is photography. And then when he had the camera, he realized that a film cameraman, it isn't just looking and finding the right moment. What he has to know about is matching, which no still photographer ever has to think about. He can do what he likes with his negative after the event in the laboratory. But films, you do one sh shot early in the day on a Monday. And on a Friday, three weeks later, you have to do a reverse angle for many, many different practical reasons. And the lighting, the tonality do have to match. And if in those days you gave particular instructions to the laboratory for the gamma you wanted to develop the film to, you have to know all these things that don't come into a still photographer's world. This was terrifying. But the other thing was for him to see how to get out of only looking at single frames. And this was where he was very afraid. He said, I have no experience of a moving camera. To his amazement, he found that he had been trained for this better than almost any cameraman, because as a still photographer, even though he only occasionally would do that, before doing that, he would be all the time looking through any situation for the best framing, for the best composition. So he knew that a moving camera that is moving from one back to encompassing it, perhaps taking it there, was part of his lifeblood. So the difficulty he didn't imagine was going to be there was all about exposure, which he thought he knew inside out. And the freedom came from the fact that he could just move freely. So he did a marvelous job. And again, we chose black and white, first of all, because it was cheaper, primarily. And secondly, because again, it took away from a false lyricism, which we didn't want the film to have. And what today is recognized, it was one or two very advanced critics at once praised this. But others were very shocked. They said, this is crude photography, because it wasn't the beautiful, well-polished photography that was expected 
in any well-made film, just with the editing, which was tough and sometimes brutal, and that shocked. Many things shocked when the film came out, and today can be seen in their right perspective. Amongst children, it's a cliche to say all children are born actors. It's half true. Either they are natural actors or they are terrible actors. And a kid trying to act is perhaps even worse than the worst amateur actor. Everything false and rigid and artificial and showy off or tense and constraint come through. But then there are others, there's no rule for it, who are born actors, who are at ease, who respond naturally, and you give them a suggestion, you say, this is a very sad situation because of this or that, and at once, from their feeling, t real tears come into their eyes without you having to explain this. So it was quite clear that with them, what we would need to do was, like with all f good film acting, on the day, or at the moment when you're filming, just give them a little simple understanding of the situation, and indeed, everything in their behavior would correspond. And that's how later, when we worked on the island, that's how it worked out. Somebody would, they knew the story, and they entered more and more into the story, and as they did so, I only needed in the last minute, like with any great professional, film actor, just to say, this is the shot in which you're looking into the distance because, and the feeling would arise. And sometimes I found, though, that as they have no psychological background in acting, thank God, if you say to a child actor, having said this line, and before you say the next line, just wait and secretly count to five. And if the actor has just said that, and a professional actor, you ask him to do it, in many cases, it would be wooden. He would turn his face there, look at someone else, and nothing would happen. But with a child, they can't remain dead inside. So between this and this, just that moment when instead of rushing in, which they would do if you hadn't said pause, and without thinking, this is an acting pause. They would just wait. But in that waiting, something full of life would come and would make the transition between that to that person and that to that person. And that little transition would happen by itself because the child would not be thinking like an actor. What is the transition emotionally that I'm going through there? They would just knowingly Go from that to that with an open waiting, and that would be full of life. My specs! Here. Here they are. They lived the story step by step. When they came to moments when they want to kill a pig and they're hungry, our only, let's say my only directorial gimmick was that day not to give them anything to eat, no breakfast. And came the moment, and even though it was hunger oh, of only four or five hours, when we roasted the pig and then said, look, you are eating with your hands, which we anyway encourage them to do. And now this 
pig that you've roasted, the meat is yours, just go for it. They were hungry enough to throw themselves on this pig, rip the piece off, and there's no directing there. There's no telling them what to do. And you see the camera there can't lie. You see the real look of kids whose only thought in mind and body is, I want to eat, and nothing's going to stop me. And then when later, we have the killing scene. The fact that we did it at night with flares and with drums playing worked them up. These kids who were already dirty, smudged, delighted to be unwashed, with long matted hair, not allowed to go in the sea for days. And those kids suddenly were war dancing with paint on their faces and chanting as savages again. What one sees on the screen is as close as one could get to the reality of the moment. And I was forced to say something quite terrible, I remember at the time, that if it hadn't been that we had a, a devoted team of helpers, of young people who were there as a holiday task, to be there to look after the kids, to mind them, we had to introduce a certain school discipline in the place where they lived. And so there was the presence of a whole adult society around them, keeping them in so that they couldn't really in three months go wild, but only pretend to go wild. Had that security not been there, I could really understand the reality of building a story. But in the real conditions, in perhaps even less time than Golden gave them, they could have come to a point of absolute savagery. Because that was Golding's thesis, that human nature, deep down, can easily revert to a fundamental savagery. The animal can really not only come for surface, but can completely dominate and wipe out all the structures of conditioning that have come by culture, different cultures, to hold all that under control. A few years ago, we gathered all the, as many of these boys together as we could, and we took them back to Vieques, and they were now men of 35, 40, and I needed to bring them together, first of all to know, for my own personal wish, and care what has become of them. That was very important. But also to know, in relation to a great debate of today, is it harmful or not for children at that age to be exposed to themes so difficult and so painful and to play perhaps abominable behavior and abominable characters? Is this harmful for children? So I really needed to know, a question that I've carried for 20 years or more, have I in making this done them harm for life? Oof, bringing them together and talking we haven't done them any harm. They all look back on this as a very formative and very positive experience. Only one of them had gone into acting. But what was interesting, and that was a deep secret satisfaction, was to find that our casting had been right because the boy playing Jack had had an adventurous career as a sort of, I don't want to say anything libelous, but of the nature of smuggling and gun running and doing things off a boat up and down the uh, South American coast. And he was an adventurer. The boy playing Ralph had become a very quiet and very serious actor, trying to resolve his own contradictions through continuing with acting. And the boy who played Simon had become a real but very expert, very competent forester 
deeply concerned with different organizations, with natural life, ecology, environment. And the boy, our piggy, who really was piggy, a splendid, rather portly, but not fat anymore, big, middle-aged man there with the same warm, outgoing nature that the original boy had, had become a businessman, very successful, dealing with confectionery in the Soviet Union, and above all, had for, I don't know if it's true today, but for, at that time, had been concerned with selling brands of chocolate within the Soviet Union, or within the, the new Russia. So <laughs> there was a relation between him and food that I found very touching. And he was, uh, also had that same fullness of somebody essentially warm and fair-minded and by nature democratic and understanding and with a natural quiet understanding that was part of the picky nature. So it was very rewarding to see them again and see that it was not harmful to put kids in a film at that age.